when we found the pictures, we came very close to getting a nice large size dumpster and just getting rid of them because we didn't know what to do. It was just boxes everywhere. But for some reason, I don't know why at the time, it just felt like at some point someone needed to see these again. Oh, yeah. These pictures somehow have to be part of the restaurant. There's a face I haven't seen in a while. Hey, go ahead. And hey, okay, thanks, Grant. sir. Thank have you. a good one. Enjoy the weekend. So we decided we'll put an area in the back room and it'll be just dedicated to the pictures. And we'll put a sign that says, Frank P's mural craft photos sold here. out-of-town antique folks would come in and say, I'll take these off your hands. Can I take a box of them? Can I take a box of them? And I felt by doing that, this collection of Laporte history was just going to be scattered into a bunch of flea markets and antique shops, and I didn't want that to happen. So I set a price of 50 cents a piece. I felt that was the only way to keep some kind of, um, I don't know, control over them, because if I would have said, well, you can browse through and take what you need or what you want. I think I would have lost all the pictures in the first two years and there wouldn't have been a collection there. But by just putting a small amount, 50 cents a piece, people are willing to take the time and actually go through the boxes and try to find themselves or their, their children or their cousins or whoever they're looking for. So I kind of feel like I'm the caretaker for those pictures. Now that I've kept them in a safe place all these years, I feel like I can maybe help him find a good home. My parents, they had Mr. P take pictures of my brother and I, and my mom and I would always go back and forth, maybe disagreeing on things, and me, I don't want to do that now. I want to do something else, and she'd say no. And it could have been doing your homework or whatever it might have been. And I happened to open my mouth, not knowing what my mom probably said or something, and I might have looked at her and just said, no, I'm not going to do that, and he took the picture. My parents would always shave our heads real short, and. Uh, one of the kids in the neighborhood started calling me Burhead. And still today, people will call, hey, is Burhead there? Or is, uh, some of the teachers, I don't even know if they know my real name is Gary. I grew up in a Polish area. We actually lived on Warsaw Street. We'd get on our bikes and drive from one park as kids to another park. We'd play softball, baseball all day. We used to play ditch em, tag, kick the can. Didn't have to worry about anything. Just had a great life out there, I really did. That's it. That's money, boy. My son, I've coached him since he's been five years old, and he's very focused on what he does. He said he'd like to be settled by the time he's a junior in high school on where he's going to go and what he's going to do. That's a good shot, Jordan. I think the difference between us, uh, I was mischievous. Uh, I would try things, doing pranks and things, and they weren't dangerous pranks or anything like that, but. Uh, 
lock the park director in the women's bathroom or something like that with the kids. My son, I don't think he has any expectations. At this point, being 15 years old, of staying in Laporte, I think that all of us leave the nest. And the only way that we all grow up is by doing that. When I was about to graduate high school, I knew I wasn't going to stay here. I had these expectations that there was this great big world out there, and I wanted to be part of it. I ended up moving out east, and I stayed there for eight years. I learned a great deal out there, grew up a lot, and when I got my feet on the ground, I knew what I wanted to do, where I wanted to go. I wanted to raise a family. I wanted more of a handle on what my son was going to be doing, be part of it. And I ended up leaving my job and coming back here. I like LaPorte, but there are a lot of things I don't like about it. I really wish there were more things for our demographic to do. I mean, there are a lot of things geared toward, there's a lot of antiquing going on in LaPorte, and no one I know that's my age really likes to go look at old stuff. It just seems like there's not much to do here, but then, like, I mean, you look around and there's plenty to do, it just people don't want to do anything, so. <laughs> it's so quaint and nice. Like, the people here are nice, and it's just a nice little town, and it's a good place to, like, grow up and start a family. This is called stippling. And see how everyone does it differently, which is great. That's what there are a lot more old people than there are young people. That's definitely one of the big problems with Laporte is there's not really that many jobs around here. Now, what can you think of that this would be? Next year, I'm going down to Indianapolis for school. Okay. After that, I don't really have too many plans to come back. Very nice. Good, good change in value. I imagine that yes. one day when I'm rich and famous and hopefully have 12 Lamborghinis in my garage, I will finally remember Laporte and all it's offered me. You know, a good set of morals, um, confidence in myself, and, I don't know, just a general sense of well-being from living here you know, ever since I was born. But, you know, I'm gonna get as far away from here as I can, as soon as I can. I was an empty nester and I thought it was wonderful. I had a clique of girlfriends, just enjoying myself and going where I wanted. No responsibilities and didn't need to come home. I enjoyed that lifestyle. Perhaps it's selfish. It's all about me. What do I want to do? But it didn't last long. That's when the grandchildren came along. I was probably seven, eight, or nine years old. My grandmother braided my hair for that picture. She would braid so tightly that I would get a migraine headache and I could barely squint my eyes. I remember it to this day. In here, Papa. Have a seat. Look up a little bit. I wanted away from my father. I'd go with the devil himself, probably. We're coming along just fine, aren't we? I want to get it under there. Whatever I did was uh, argument. Look up at me, Papa. This is in the 60s okay. with uh, mini skirts, high boots, chunky-heeled shoes. He wanted me in the winter when I was going out to wear a hat, coat, and gloves. 
Well, I just spent an hour on my hair, teasing it up all high, getting it perfect. I certainly didn't want to mash it down with a hat. He and I argued so much, I wanted out of the house. A young man came along, and so I married him. Now, I want, uh, stick your tongue out. Perfect. He was in the military, and I was expecting to be a military wife and returned to Laporte in 25 years. But that marriage crashed and burned, and I would go to work $5 an hour and have my two children and uh, pay all the expenses, and I'd have nothing left over. I think it's OK. I think it's OK. My father moved in last fall. He's an Alzheimer's patient. This disease, no, no, I think he mellowed with age. I think I finally got his approval, or it doesn't matter if I wear a hat out in the winter. It doesn't matter what I do. He knows that I'm taking care of him, and uh, there's never any negativity with him. Ladies! 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 My daughter seemed to follow all the rules. My son fell through the cracks somewhere. That led him to Indiana State Prison. His two children, their mother was in prison and jail both when the babies were born. If I wouldn't have taken them, they would have gone to Child Protective Services. My friends could not believe that I was going to actually take these babies. Out of all of the girlfriends, I was the least likely to show motherhood instincts. It's strange how the world operates and you become what you really didn't want to. Grandpa had several boxes of, I wouldn't call them portraits yet, they were more proofs. After one box was filled, he'd start another one. I have heard tell of this story that people went into the diner. Grandpa had taken their wedding pictures, but after they had them taken, they couldn't afford to pick them up. Some 50 years later, I believe, thanks to John keeping those photographs, they found their wedding photos that they had never had. My grandpa must have had a very good connection with the people of Laporte. They always were busy, always had a lot of customers. He always strove for the most flattering shot. Uh, sometimes I don't suppose he had the most <laughs> uh, flattering uh, subjects but he'd make them look as, as good as they could possibly look. My brother and I, we'd go up to the studio. Usually Grandpa would say, come in the back and let me get a picture. A lot of times he did pictures in stages or at the same time each year. That was important to him. It was a way of showing history, I guess. We didn't do the mark on the walls, we did photographs. The studio was on the second floor, and there was a diner, I think it was called an American restaurant then. I would get my cherry Coke, and I would be a big girl and sit in that chair, you know, all by myself. And then I'd go back upstairs and talk to Grandpa and Grandma some more. I think when people came to my grandfather, they were usually milestones in their life. Grandpa always wanted people to feel comfortable. He wouldn't always just have them come in and sit right down and start snapping pictures right away. He would talk to them and put them at ease. A 
little children were probably his favorite to do. Adults now my age in Laporte probably remember the Ferris wheel Grandpa had built for my mother when she was a young girl. You know, all it took was one kid to say, Mr. Pease has got the Ferris wheel open, you know, let's go, and they would line up. Not only was my grandfather a perfectionist, but Grandma was as well. Grandma would greet the customers, and after the portraits were taken, she would color the pictures in with a Q-tip. And Grandma would write all these directions down of what colors went where, and the color of their eyes and their hair. And after the final product was delivered to the customer, the proofs would go in a box. They were just a wonderful team. I really don't think there could have been a Miracraft studio without both of them. I think I asked a question ahead of time. I said, do you think you'll ever marry me? And at that point, she said, yeah, I, th I think so. Well, that <laughs> kind of, to me... That was our proposal. ...was a great indication that this is going to work. She really is going to try to marry me. And I'm really <laughs> happy about it. So when I do ask her, I don't have a surprise of her thinking no. No. It would have been in 1971. You know, we dressed up nice. We sat together and we posed. And I remember somebody telling me, you know, you need to be serious about this because this is marriage and it's not something taken lightly. You see a lot of engagement pictures today where the kids are smiling and they're kind of goofing off or they may be in different poses, but we were very formal and I thought, well, this is right. This is a very serious occasion. To be honest with you, what attracted me to Hugh was his car, a brand new Barracuda. 1968 Barracuda. It had 275 horsepower, it was a high performance engine, had a four barrel carburetor. This car could really fly. We'd cat the drag from one end of the town to the other, pick up a couple friends and they would cat the drag with you back and forth. And you just did that all night long. Of course, our parents thought we were wasting gas. And uh, I hope the statute of limitations has passed because we would actually go out and drag race from time to time. Fun plan is to Burger King part time and then win a lottery. <laughs> <laughs> That's my life plan. <laughs> we do not break the law in any way with our car. We do not perform illegal activities, break the speed limit, run stop signs or stop lights, and we do not race our vehicles against other yeah. cars. I, don't, I love doing the speed limit when I'm not behind somebody. I like stopping at all the stop signs because when you drive a five speed, it's hard to get going again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He's flipping us off or he's going like this? He's going like this. Ever since the first time we met, we hit it off right away and fell in love. I invited him to my house and we talked until 4 o'clock in the morning on my porch. Just about everything. We didn't even really know each other at that point, too. We had the whole world to talk about. That's the one thing I do like about LaPorte is we were able to find each other and be very happy. It was only recently that Hugh admitted to our kids that he used to drag race. So our kids know their dad did that. It's one of the few rebellious things he did growing up. And we were so foolish because when we got married, we sold that car for a four-door, what? Chevy Nova, <laughs> 1972 Chevy Nova. And in fact, if you look on eBay now, I saw a Barracuda that was about 50 some thousand dollars yeah. the other day on, we're on eBay. We're sick, we're sick.
Okay, make sure you have this over your face. Okay? Does it look fine with it that You far back? are absolutely beautiful. No, I'm talking about this. Does it look fine with it all the way? Because I put it down low, you know? Like it doesn't look funky right hold on, here. Hold on. No, as long as he pulls it like that, you're beautiful. You're beautiful no matter what. Of course she is. Love you. All right, I'm going out to the park. Um, I need to uh, look for something. What do you need? I'm looking for my bracelet. Dear friends, we are gathered here in the sight of God and in the presence of these witnesses to join together this man, Justin, Isaiah, Lee Van Schoik, and this woman, Johnny Danielle Jones, in a holy matrimony, which is an honorable estate. Hand in hand, you enter marriage today. Hand in hand, you step out in hope. You have made a very serious, important decision in choosing to marry each other today. Justin, do you understand and accept this responsibility? That I do. And Johnny, do you understand and accept this responsibility? Of course I do. By the authority invested in me as a minister of the gospel of Christ, I pronounce that you are a husband and wife together. You may kiss your bride. Thank God. We've been married 36 years, almost 37. Cannot be possible, but it is. It hasn't been hard. We've had hard times. You know, there are times when I just really can't stand Hugh, <laughs> and maybe vice versa. But we have learned as we've gone along, and we, we are still learning. There's a lot of things that we assume coming into marriage that just didn't happen, but we are committed to each other, and that's been the big point. I've often looked at others as models. Somebody that's been married 30, 40 years and been through quite a bit. I think, what's that couple got that makes that commitment stick? As you get older, you realize some of the goals you set when you were young are really no longer valid. When I was young, I always wanted a speedboat. I thought that was the most important thing, and if I did not have a speedboat by the time I was 30, it was definitely a failure. And now that I'm this old, the speedboat really doesn't mean anything to me. I wouldn't want one now anyway. I thought I'd be retired by this age. I thought this would be a really old age and I should definitely have made it in the world. Well, I'm still working and I'm probably gonna continue for a little bit. Every time you lose one dream, you just 
pick up a piece and start fresh and you find a new dream. And you aspire to that. I've always felt the land should be mine. My great-grandfather owned the land back in 1891. He created a farm. It was called Laporte Farms. He was the strawberry king of Pine Lake Avenue. The Depression hit, and part of the farm was sold off in small lots. And now I have 17 and a half acres left of what was once the Laporte Farms that my great-grandfather owned. My family has 12 wooded acres. We enjoy the woods and we enjoy walking through it, so we cleared a lot of trees about four years ago. We named the different little roadways. The one we're on is Henry Boulevard. That one goes right along the top edge of the pond. This would be Merhanka's Bend. And then we have James Way here. Then we come up to Possum Pass, because there was a dead possum, so we passed. And it all comes up to dry socket right here and hooks back up into Henry Boulevard and back into the yard. I call it Carolyn's Little Corner of the World. I grew up here, I've raised my children here, and I hope to keep this land in the family for many years to come. I'd like to save it for posterity and just be known as the guardian of the land forever. Now, here's my goal. I want to find a house in this area, no, no more than a block in each direction. I want to find a house. So I like this area. Are you serious? I love I this area. South. You I sure you don't want to move to, like, uh, Florida, you know? No, I got to stay in La Porte, dude. I want to <laughs> Oh, you're not even Valpo, huh? No, I'm, I'm staying in La Porte. Oh, waving Nathan. See, Nathan's waving at you. Say hi. I don't see your girlfriend outside, though. I don't think they're home. <sighs> what? You don't like her? Exactly. Don't talk to me. Don't talk to you? Why? You shy? You got a girlfriend? Stop it. You ride Jersey on your Stop motorcycle. It. I do now. Yes, you do, too. I, I see you do it. I <laughs> Oh, really? Hey, Cam, you know why this window's so messy? Yeah. Give me one good reason. That's exactly why. You know how many times mommy cleans that window? Yeah. How many times? A whole bunch. Family number one. That is always our motto. Support had two outs on them last night in the seventh. And that guy gave up a grand slam. They got beat. Not very often the port doesn't get out of the sex notes, you know. Yeah, boy, they've had trouble though. Since old Schreiber quit. Yeah, I'm not sure, but my father wanted me and uh, thought I would be a farmer, but in high school I had good teachers and uh, they encouraged me to go to college. And that's when I started my teaching career. As I recall, Pease took our senior pictures and I just happened to be the principal then. Yeah. Hey, see you, Eric. Yeah. Bye. 
I hope we win. <laughs> you, you win. Well, that was the boss. Smile. You got your best contact. <laughs> Mr. <Mister> America. <laughs> yeah, right. Jeff and I have always had a good relationship. He opened the uh, pipe shop after he got back from Vietnam, and I've been going there ever since, and I still go there. Jimmy, welcome back. You catch any fish? Yeah, we did. Joya, what are you all dressed up for? Are you looking for a wife or something? Yeah. When I opened up, I had a bunch of pipes, but uh, it was like nobody was interested in pipes anymore. So I haven't had a pipe for over 35 years. Hey, Marge, this is Jeff at the pipe shop. We found your keys. They were out in the grass. People think that uh, if you want to find out anything about what's happening around the port, the pipe shop's one of the places from the town clowns to politicians and everybody in between. It's got a cross section that's probably equivalent to uh, what a church has, I'd say. How many women do you think you've supped with in your lifetime? Not enough. There's an awful lot of churches here in uh, there's also an awful lot of bars. There's probably over 40. I can name about all of them. I've been to probably all of them. I go to Ogles a lot. That's a good starting point. I go to Dick's Bar, and I go to State Street, Shooters, and Third Base, and the Warehouse. There is no beer in heaven. That's why we drink it here. I pretty much blend in any place that I go that's got alcohol. The best birthday party I ever had was my 50th. I jumped out of a cake with two naked women. My mom and dad were there. That didn't freak them out. But I invited my minister and his wife, and I honestly didn't think they would come. And we shot out of there. And they were totally naked with just whipped cream and stuff. And I wasn't far behind. And I swear, I'll never forget my minister and his wife's eyes. They got that big. But you know what? It was a great party. I collect a lot of things just because I think they're neat, you know, sports, drinking, rock and rolls, my favorites. But I got a lot of things in here that aren't that either. I've got 62 clocks here. They're all neat, but uh, none of them have batteries in them because I'm on Jeff Dunk time. Yeah, this is the old buffalo here. I got this from my ex-wife. My nickname was the Buffalo. And I got this for an anniversary present. My cleaning gal, I've had her for a long time, and she's a sport. And she made this buffalo's butt out of a rug and carved a heart in it. Because on the other side of this wall is where that buffalo head is. This is a Viet Cong recoilless rock around. I took the detonator out, mailed it to my folks. They about had the big one. I was only 19, and at 19, being in Vietnam is pretty young. I wasn't quite ready for it. We got some neat things in here. This right here is my kid, Slam. His name was Jonathan, we call him Slam Dunk. He's born on 4th of July. He thought I had to parade for him every year until he's about five. And I told him if he'd be good, I'd even bring the Jets in. Seven years ago, September 1st, he got killed. I still cry every day. His mother does, her whole family does, and the whole town did. You just have to pick yourself up, because we're here not that long. And it's fun to have fun. And that is what's carved on the bottom of my gravestone, so help me God. Fun to be an American, fun to be a Laportean. It's fun to have fun. Jeff did get into some things that most kids do. Some of them get caught and some of them don't, but 
I always figured everybody was going to make some mistakes because most kids do, and you can't rule with an iron fist, and you you got to have a positive approach that that's part of growing up and it's not right, and and you made the mistake, but try not to make it again and don't make a habit of making it. It's your attitude of what they can become after they've done something wrong or not obeyed or stole something. It doesn't make any difference what it is. That's kind of the way I ruled in the family, and I think it's how I ruled in the school. We got to have answers for their questions and hope that we'll help them, that they'll be good citizens and good parents. Those are the things that's always been first in my mind. Daddy, push me, Daddy, Daddy. Good. It's the kids and their future. Having fun? <laughs> All right, Mona. My son has been home for approximately, oh, 10 days now. Sit up in there nice. If he breaks the rules, he can go back to prison for two years. Turn around, sit your butt in the seat. Everyone lives through bad choices and makes amends. Look, you're going over daddy's head. In the meantime, uh, there's two darling little children that I love very much, and it's my prayer that he chooses them instead of drugs. Superman. I did Superman. <laughs> it's in my heart, and I voiced it to him, that I do not want my grandchildren to grow up poor. Come here, sit up here with Daddy. Oh. I need him to work up to a man's wage where he can financially provide for his family. And I can pull out my suitcase, pack my clothes, get in the car, and drive away. You can't catch me! I'm a gingerbread man! Coming from prison, I'm sure he fantasized about this home. On the second or third day, I said, is this as good as what you were uh, thinking about and wishing for when you were locked up? And he looks at me, he smiles, and he says, better. And I said, I love you. And he says, I love you too. It does hurt a little bit when I see people who have families that are always there for them and are always taking care of them. And, you know, when your family gives up on you, I mean, you kind of want to give up on yourself. Because if your own family can't have the willpower to love you, then what makes you think anybody else can? When I was 11 years old, my dad walked out on my family and kind of left me and my six brothers and sisters to take care of my mom, who obviously wasn't strong enough to take care of us. And then my stepdad moved in a week after he left, so I'm assuming you can guess why my dad left. One night, there was a bunch of problems, and I ended up calling the police on my stepdad, which made my mom kick me out. And so I've been on my own since January 1st of this year. I actually have already slept outside once or twice, and it's really scary. You just have to be really conspicuous about where you sleep. <laughs> you know, you're supposed to be able to rely on your family for a lot of things, and I haven't been able to rely on them for much of anything. I've been basically taking care of myself since I was 12. I'm going to be the first kid in my family to go to college. And about halfway through my senior year, I didn't think I was going to make it. For me, it's just too many bad memories. So that's why I guess starting my life over in a different town is my only option.
I had a perfect childhood. I felt safe. I felt inspired. It's such a beautiful town filled with these beautiful homes and beautiful avenues and the trees. This kind of remnant of a more gracious, slower and gentle, peaceful way of life. I do remember the Peas studio, the lights and the different backdrops. I loved that as a kid, the idea of fantasy and theater, theatricality. And I think that's one of the things that helped me go down my path as a performer. Do you think that be natural in bar four could be more beautiful? I dare not say the word, but a little warm it up with a little bit of vibrato. <laughs> and always be aware that I'm going to move forward, I'm going to slow down. So we're going to add just a little vibrato, just a little to warm it up. Does that make sense? Is that a deal? Play it with impunity. One and a two and a. When I was in high school, I had several teachers that were eager for me to fulfill my potential. So many people in Laporte came from other places. There were so many European immigrants, and there was still this feeling that to accomplish some things, you needed to go away from home. As a conductor, I try to create a community where everybody is important and everybody has a voice. Those were the community values that I was raised with. Good, very good. Was that too fast? Slower. Too slow. Yeah. Okay. But you must stamp your foot. <laughs> Maestro, the tempo was too slow. Let's move on. 32. And up. I have a partner, and three years ago, we got married in Toronto. Well, all the jokes about being married are true. We've been together for 24 years. Sometimes it seems like 2,400. He's been to Laporte many times and been part of every family function. We really are a team. It's interesting, I think, being a New Yorker and hearing a lot about Middle America. Well, I know Middle America intimately, but I really think Middle America is far more universal than that. I think the ideals that Laporte stood for and tried to realize are the ideals that New Yorkers are trying to realize. Physically, they're very different cities, but emotionally, I think they're exactly the same. I dream of Laporte. I have these vivid dreams of being home. 
I've lived in New York now for 25 years, and before that, 15 years in Boston. I've lived in Toronto. I've lived in lots of places. But LaPorte will always be my home. I'm a slicer through and through. In the early 1920s, uh, for some reason or other, there wasn't enough money in the school budget to buy uh, uniforms for the football team. So the uh, U.S. Slicing Machine Company, which was one of the big industries here, donated uh, the money for the football uniforms. Well, the, uh, the boys on the team decided, well, geez, the Slicing Machine Company, you know, Slicer, that sounds like a good fighting name. So teams have always been known as the Laporte Slicers ever since. My family has lived here since 1836. And I think the town was founded in 1832. It's a manufacturing town. And the period of 1942 about the middle 1980s was a real period of prosperity. During the 90s, a lot of industry that had been here gradually moved away for various reasons. The Slicing Machine Company no longer does business here. The Alice Shamos Company, which employed uh, three or 4,000 people, went out of business. So things are a lot slower than they were 10, 15 years ago. The making of things is always going to go to the place where they can be made the, the cheapest. That is why the port has been drained of a lot of jobs that we used to have. Being a smaller town like Laporte, so many of the young people, when they grow up, move away to other parts of the country. My son's uh, Frederick and my younger son, Chris, they both found jobs in other places. I'm the only one left today. I'm the last member of the family to live in Laporte. <laughs> so that's kind of a sad thing, but uh, that's the way things work out. Young men and women, many of them very talented people, leave. On the other hand, we have outsiders that come in to fill the gap. And so I suppose it all balances out in the long run. What can we get for you today? Stack and slada. Stack and All right. Did you want chicken steak or tofu on that? Tofu. Very cool. My name is Frank Torres. Taking a beer for you? My brother's name is Jose. We're originally from California. And it comes with a little bit of beans inside. Did you want black beans or pinto beans? I came out here visiting a friend, actually. I met a girl. And I ended up moving out here for her. I was kind of sick of working for other people. My brother moved in with me, and we started a restaurant. I mean, people tell me all the time how even like 20 years ago, downtown Laporte used to be shoulder to shoulder people on Friday nights where, you know, all the businesses were open and thriving. and. If you drive around now, I mean, it seems like half the businesses are either for sale or just closed. From what I get from, like, a lot of people, it's like that there is kind of two different groups. People who, like, they're used to the way things are, and, I mean, they don't think anything's really wrong with the way things are. And then there's another group of people more interested in having the port kind of, you know, progress along with the other towns in the area. I guess the, the weirdest thing is that Instead of having like the younger Laporte people trying to bring the town back up, it seems like the main kind of like thrust is getting is from people coming in from other parts of either state or even like the country. I just, I don't know, I find that kind of weird.
How do you spell Laporte? Capital L A. Capital L A. Capital A. No. <laughs> Capital L. Capital L A. Now this is optional. The space. You either put a space in there, or you don't. Is there a space in Laporte? I don't think there is mm -hmm. a space. I don't think so. Capital L A space capital P O R T E. It's a true French word. La porte. The door. There is no space. L A P O R T E. Some people put La porte. There is a space. I don't think there's a space there. I put the space in. I put the space in. <laughs> is there an official spelling of La porte? Is it officially with a space or without a space? Capital L, small a, capital P, O-R-T-E. No space. That's how I spell it, and my mail seems to be delivered all the time, so. I always think of it as two words, la porte, the door. I think it's important that it's spelled properly and with the space. It's a generational thing. L-A space P-O-R-T-E. I spell it the same way, L-A space P-O-R-T-E. I'd have to go with the official version. I'm willing to accept a space or go without a space. My grandfather had written my grandmother a poem on their 23rd anniversary. This lifeboat of ours, how easy it steers. It seems like a minute these 23 years. Sometimes I'm the pilot, or often it's you, who guides it so well when the skies aren't blue. But a boat can just float or sink in the sea if you aren't in it and sailing with me. It's unfortunate, but often the things that we enjoy the most sometimes are the first things to leave us. With my grandfather, he began to lose his eyesight through glaucoma. Again, my grandparents were such a team. He was, you know, still doing the portraits. And she would set the settings for him. For a while, he used a flashlight to be able to see him. And when that didn't work anymore, she would set the camera lens for him. But I'm telling you, the portraits were no different. And I'm sure that had to do with the teamwork. The picture of the couple, the Tonicals, to show you just how much of a team my grandparents were, that was actually my grandmother that took that photo, that portrait. Uh, my grandfather passed away uh, September 10th, I believe, uh, 1970. And that picture was taken, I believe, in 71 or 72, around that area. And so she continued after my grandfather died for probably four or five years. And I don't believe anyone would have been able to tell that that was not actually taken by Frank C.P.'s. But it was Muralcraft Studio.
Okay. Okay, just like that. We're gonna take your right foot, stretch it out just a little bit further, and then bring your back up a little taller. You wanna take your hands, hold right onto her waist, and then lean forward just a little bit. You can scoot back on her just slightly. That's good. Your chest could kind of come in and touch her just a little bit like that. I want you to kind of just feel how much you guys like each other. That's it. Someday it could be an engagement ring right there. Oh, that big rock is going to be great. I can just see the now. And one more this time. Slide your left hand back so the thumb is behind her a little bit more. That's it. Go ahead, just like that. We always plan on being together, no matter what. My mother says that if we get in a huge fight, what am I going to do? I'm going to be completely heartbroken. I should have gone out and dated more people. I'm happy with him, so I'd really not like to break up with him to find some other people. <laughs> Want your heads a little closer together, but don't quite touch. We've talked a lot about eventually moving to the East Coast or something. As far as coming back to LaPorte, I really don't see it happening. You're going to turn your head a little bit this way and then tilt it like that. We have been a couple for two years now. Wow. I've spent a ninth of my life dating you. Yeah. <laughs> Is that bad? A ninth. <laughs> People don't understand how important photographs are. Especially with the digital age today, they keep these photographs inside their camera. They look through them, they look through them again, and all of a sudden they need the file space on the camera, so they delete it, take another picture, they delete another one, take another picture. They never have them printed anymore. Every time someone sits down, whether it's a child, a high school senior, or a family member, we look at it as a responsibility that we are capturing this now for the family. We don't know if they'll have a car accident once they leave. And we've had that happen to high school seniors who have had that happen. And this is the last portrait that they've ever had taken. To me, it's very meaningful to make sure that this is something that parents will always have, the grandparents will always have, something that even the children will have to remember their grandparents by. I have been in Laporte all my life, been a photographer for almost 40 years. And after I got married and we had children, we took our children to uh, Frank Peeves to be photographed. As I'm going through my mother and father's house, one girlfriend said it cannot be a monument year after year after year. Clean it out, rent it, sell it, do something with it, but don't go there and keep it as a shrine and mow the grass once a week. Life moves on. I searched for many years. What is my passion? What can I throw my whole self into? What else is out there for me? It was a waste of time on my part. I should have just been kicking back and enjoying life instead of striving to find it. It found me, and that would be 
My job and my passion is caring for my father and the two children. I know now that you will find your passion. You will stumble somehow into what is correct and what you should be doing. You will be doing. remembering the way Laporte really was? Or am I making some kind of a fantasy? This beautiful way of life is so fragile, and who knows how it's going to change. But I've been astounded at the continuity I feel there. Maybe not the same people, but it's like looking at a stream. The stream looks the same. The water in the stream is different. I'm very jealous of people who live in Laporte now. And I still think I would be wonderfully happy there. But I haven't made it back there yet. But I might. Mm -hmm.